Hello, and thank you for joining us. This is No Sound Bites Allowed, and I am your host, Michael Valls, Dragon of the Southern Tier. I'm happy to be here with you today as we're going to be addressing something that we think is pretty important, an issue that's going to be affecting the future of America. In fact, it's a bit of a prediction, a little bit ahead of time, but we think it's important for you to consider this today. We think this is something that you're going to want to know about and be prepared for. Most importantly, to prepare for what will be coming down and affecting not only the United States, but the entire globe. And we're going to explain exactly what we mean in just a moment. But first, we do want to mention that if this is the first time that you are joining us on the channel, we welcome you and we thank you for being part of our audience. We want you to know that we do long-form political commentary. And every Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we do a live stream with you. We reach out on Facebook, Twitter, DLive, uh, YouTube to hear your chats, your tweets, and even your phone calls to let us know what you think about the issues that are affecting us all across the globe from anywhere in the world. Because we believe in the First Amendment. We believe that you have an inalienable right to free speech. And it doesn't matter which country you're in, doesn't matter what your government may believe or the internet overlords, you have a right to say whatever you think about what's going on. And we want to hear your voice every Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We hope to see you in the next live stream. With that said, let's go to what is happening right now, or rather, what we saw that made us say, we need to talk about this. This is a prediction we're going to be making, and this prediction will be coming up very quickly in 2023. I know, it's just after the elections of 2021. Most people have forgotten about politics. Politics has dropped off the attention of most people, not only in America, but around the world. And yet, at this very moment, most of the political elites are out there, they're planning already. They're planning for the 2022 midterm elections. They're planning for the 2023 elections and to set up for the next presidential race of 2024. So this is critical. This is the time, believe it or not, this far ahead that we're seeing a lot of the political dominoes being set in place to fall down in the next couple of months. So we're going to talk about that in one second. But this is what we were looking at. We were watching, the, uh, besides watching the Kyle Rittenhouse trial and seeing the fiasco that has happened there, the travesty that has gone on with the prosecution from, quote, Little Binger, end quote, and his associate Lunchbox, otherwise known as Prosecutor Binger and Prosecutor Kraus. But we also were watching what was happening in the United States Senate. And there was a conversation with Secretary Mayorkas. And in this case, Senator Josh Hawley asked a very important question that I want you to consider for a moment. I want to ask you about something else that's been in the news. Back in March, when the president said that, that uh, Vice President Harris would be his border czar. He said she's the most qualified person to help in stemming the movement of so many folks, stemming the migration to our southern border. That's President Biden. Do you report to her? Uh, Senator, I uh, report to the vice president and the president, and your question misstates uh, the facts. The president did not appoint the vice president to be the border czar. Um, he uh, um, asked her to lead the effort in addressing the root causes of irregular migration. Those ah. are two very different things. Ah, I see. So is she working closely with you on that uh, Im important endeavor? Uh, How often do you meet with her? Uh, I am uh, certainly in close touch with the vice president. This How often do you meet on this subject? Uh, I've met uh, with the vice president um, more than a handful of times. B more than a handful? Well, so what's that well, mean? I'm Six or seven I'm times in the last year? Oh, no. Uh, first of all, I have not been in office for a year, uh, Senator. Um, uh, secondly, I am in close touch. So she's very involved in the department's policies and in, and in, in, in what's happening at the southern border. You've traveled to the border together. Um, Senator, allow me to repeat my testimony that the vice president's focus 
is on addressing the root cause. I heard your testimony. My, I'm asking you a question. My question is, do you travel to the border together? Are you, are you devising policies together? Um, I have traveled uh, to the border once with the Vice President to El Paso, Texas, so that she could see firsthand uh, the challenges that we face. And has she been part of your, your policies to your decision to end the Remain in Mexico policy, to end the public charge rule, uh, to change the ICE guidance? Has she been part of those decisions? I, I have not consulted with the Vice President directly about those policies. So what is she doing exactly? Um, you said she's not the border czar, that that's, that's not her role. We were wrong about that. She's not doing anything like that. She's doing something very different, is what your testimony is. But she's, you're not actually consulting with her on any policy. So what is it that she's doing exactly? Uh, Senator, as I have uh, repeatedly testified, she is focused on addressing the root causes of irregular migration in the context of the migration challenge. How's that been going? And um, that is a, um, we are advancing considerably. And in fact, I am contributing to that effort. I have you think met, the policies are working? I, I have met with the leadership in Mexico, in Guatemala, in El Salvador, in Honduras, and other countries to address. And those efforts are working? That's been successful? Oh, this is a, um, uh, this is a Time process is uh, that takes time and delivers an enduring solution. Okay. That's a lot. I know. You listen to it and you're saying, what exactly is going on? What is it that Kamala Harris is actually doing? And we notice that Secretary Mayorkas is mentioning all these countries that he's gone to, all of the meetings that he's had, and the policies that he's working on. What's Kamala Harris actually doing? Now, this is pretty important because we think and we have said on this channel since, well, actually, since we've been talking to Larry Sharp back in 2019 and 2020, when we were talking with him about the 2020 election, we've held the view that Joe Biden will not complete his time as president. We are strongly uh, in the view that Joe Biden will have the 25th Amendment executed against him, and that is the removal of a president before their time is up because of illness or mental deficiency. And we believe that you will see that happen in November of 2022, immediately after the 2022 midterm elections, so as to not cause turmoil for Democrats who already are fighting an uphill battle to try and maintain control of the Congress and the Senate. And we believe that by January of 2023, you will see the inauguration of Kamala Harris in the White House. We stand by that. We believe that. We are sure of that prediction. We have no doubt that that will happen. Now, what if we are right? If we are correct, what are we seeing and what will we expect from a Kamala Harris 2023? This is an important question. It has an impact internationally as well as within the United States. In fact, what do we know about Kamala Harris? Because we've spoken about her quite a bit on this channel. In fact, going back to just recently in May 23rd, we were talking about her influence internationally when she embarrassed the United States, insulted one of our allies in Asia, in particular in South Korea, a critical nation that is directly involved with North Korea. And she embarrassed the United States. She insulted our allies by wiping her hands after shaking the hand of the president of South Korea. There is no greater insult that you could possibly imagine being given to a world leader and, and essentially an action of disgust for having to touch or be around another world leader. That's not beneficial. In fact, since that time, we've seen that Kamala Harris has gone down in the ratings amongst the public. And in fact, back in as recently as August, we knew for a fact that Kamala Harris was so disliked that Dan Quayle, that's right, Vice President Dan Quayle, going back to the 1990s, he was more popular than Kamala Harris is. And that's even after the entire potato incident. 
And if you're not familiar with that, we would suggest you look at uh, look in the links of the description of the video, and you'll see that uh, video so you can see who Dan Quayle is and how badly Kamala Harris is rating against him. But this is not a new thing. Kamala Harris hasn't really ever been well-liked. And I'm not talking about conservatives. I'm not talking about libertarians. I'm not even talking about with Republicans. Kamala Harris was disliked by Democrats from almost day one. In fact, if we look at it, uh, going back, and this is from Vox, and I want to be very clear, this is Vox. This is as left-leaning a site as you can get. It's even more left-leaning by some uh, criteria than Huffington Post. And they're talking about Kamala Harris's decline in polls, and they are trying to explain that in December 3rd of 2019. And this is right about the same time that Kamala Harris dropped out of the 2020 presidential race. She was that despised. She was in last place. She had peaked in June at 15% of Democrats supporting her and dropped out of the race at 5%. To quote, to quote Vox, coupled with fundraising, her central struggle appears to be a lack of consistent connection with voters. Voters, in particular, Democratic voters, the Democratic Party, did not feel Kamala Harris was suitable and capable. They didn't have any belief in her. They go on to say, according to YouGov Blue, senior political analyst John Ray, 5% of Democratic primary voters definitively chose Harris as their number one candidate before her viral debate, the mo debate moment in June, which means the polling slump she experienced brought her back to where she was before, roughly. So she was at 5% approval from Democrats. And she ran up having a good first debate. And in that debate, she attacked Joe Biden and essentially called him a racist. And after that moment, her moment in the spotlight, she fell back to the same thing. Democrats, Democrats, not Republicans, not conservatives, not libertarians, Democrats said there was nothing there. She had a snappy line, and that wasn't enough to give her the presidency. And so we have to wonder, what is it about Kamala, Kamala Harris that we can look at and say, well, this is what we can expect. This is what we want to see in a president. Well, forget that. What is it that we know about Kamala Harris from looking at her past that tells us what we can expect in the future in 2023 if our prediction about the 25th Amendment and Joe Biden is correct? What about the economy? What's going to happen? Well, one of the things we can definitively say about Kamala Harris as we can see from Forbes back in uh, July of 2020, speaking about Kamala Harris after she had been uh, the nominee for vice president under Joe Biden, we know that Kamala Harris was making the case uh, to take on a stimulus package that included a $2,000 per month stimulus check and wiping out student loan forgiveness. Now, let's put this into perspective here. First of all, you're talking about wiping out student loan debt. Well, why? We have to ask a question. Why should American taxpayers, people who have either graduated from college or those who never went to college, why should they pay for the debt of the few people who did go to college? If you're 50, 60 years old, you're living on retirement, they want to take your tax money to pay off the debt of students in college today who are 20. Why is that debt your responsibility after raising your family, getting your own kids to college or helping them start their careers, getting their lives in place, taking care of your grandparents and living off of, assuming your grandchildren, and trying to live off of your retirement and that retirement money 
besides being eaten away by inflation, it's also going to be going to pay off someone else's debt that you didn't incur? That doesn't sound like sound economic policy. It doesn't even sound favorable to most people in America. But the big thing that we want to look at for a moment is the $2,000. Now, this was at the height of the lockdowns in America. And this is during the pandemic. And we want to be very clear. This isn't a new idea. This is actually Andrew Yang's idea. This is the idea of another failed presidential candidate, Andrew Yang, who also failed in his run for the mayor of New York, of New York City. And Andrew Yang believes in the universal basic income, an idea where the government will pay you money every month. Now, according to Kamala Harris, she wanted to pay American citizens $2,000 per month. This is according to Forbes. And we know that at the time, somewhere around 40 million Americans were without work. So we're talking about $80 billion of debt, nothing but pure debt that would be spent by the government for you. Well, let's think about that. When the government decided under the Biden administration, we paid over $600 per month to keep Americans out of work because of the pandemic. And that has resulted in higher levels of unemployment and massive inflation and businesses that cannot get employees. They cannot fill jobs. And imagine if that was at $600, what would have been the impact at $2,000, $80 billion a month for the United States? That's an enormous amount of money. You're talking about roughly half a trillion dollars just in the first six months of the Biden administration. This is what kind of economic policies that the Kamala Harris, if she were to become uh, president, would be her policies, tax and spend policies, policies that waste your money and drive up inflation. As we see, with just the $600 payments that we have seen from the Biden administration that have destroyed businesses, Inflation is at 6.2%, a 31-year high. There are now people who are speaking about stagflation, an economic miasma that has not existed since the Carter administration from the late 70s. And Kamala Harris is in favor of tax and spend policies that would triple the damage that is being done already. So economically we could say she's not the best choice. Let's think about what about another big issue that's affecting America? Looking at red flag laws, looking at the New York Safe Act, looking at gun control initiatives with Joe Biden going on CNN during a town hall, a national broadcast that said, yes, he would, Joe Biden is willing to take nine millimeter handguns away from the public. In fact, he's willing to take away any semi-automatic firearm that is capable of firing 20 rounds or more, which is every semi-automatic firearm in America. He was willing to disarm women and all Americans and leave them defenseless. But what did Kamala Harris have to say about gun control? What can we divine from her past that will affect our future. Well, let's take a look. According to Reuters, and this is from Reuters on August 20th of 2020, after she had been named the vice presidential pick, we see that she said in 2019, in a fact check, and they are fact checking Kamala Harris and her proposed executive order on gun control that she initially stated back in 2019. And the fact check from Reuters goes on to mention that on April 22nd, 2019, Kamala Harris stated that if she had been elected, she would give lawmakers 100 days, Congress would have 100 days to pass, quote, reasonable 
gun safety laws, end quote. And that if they did not do so, and she said, if they fail to do it, then she will, quote, take executive action. So she would bypass the three tiers of the United States government. She would literally usurp the power of Congress and pass legislation, much like we see now with the Biden administration passing mandates that are illegal and unconstitutional, bypassing the Congress to create law. That is something that no president can do and Kamala Harris promised to do. That should trouble everyone when we know that this is an overreach of government, but she went further. In addition, she went on with a third stipulation that would prohibit fugitives from justice to purchase any kind of weapon that already exists, that's already there. So that was a bit troubling, but then in August of 2019, Kamala Harris went even further. When asked by the conservative outlet, the Washington Examiner, if any of her proposals for a process of ban, uh, were a process for a ban of certain types of guns, if she would ban semi-automatic firearms, rifles, something that is often mislabeled and misnamed as an assault weapon, which it is not, it is a semi-automatic rifle, she asked about whether there would be, or they asked her about, whether there would be a database of gun owners. That's a troubling thought. For anyone who owns a firearm, that means that the government would be identifying you, isolating you, targeting you much like we have seen with the pandemic and the mandates and the way that the government is currently trying to create a list of individuals who are a, quote, danger to themselves and others for not taking a mandate, which then plays into the red flag laws in 18 states and being attempted to be passed as a national level, which means that through the red flag laws and the pandemic mandates, there are 165 million Americans potentially that would be placed on a list that would allow the government to come to your home and take your property and in many states to also take your children as if that, because if that home is too, is considered unsafe, then your children cannot be there. Check every state, look at their child protective services and you will see that same delineation, that same mission and that's a problem. But Kamala Harris went on to say and talked about her experience as a California attorney general, stating that her office, quote, put resources into allowing law enforcement to actually knock on the doors of people who are on two lists. And she explained that, quote, a list where they had been found by a court to be a danger to themselves and others. That's the red flag laws and were on a list where they were precluded and prohibited from owning a gun because of a conviction that prohibited ownership. And she said, the entries of these lists, Harris said, were combined and then law enforcement was sent out to take those guns. The government was sent out to take the firearms because Kamala Harris wanted to create necessary separate legal good ownership from other gun-related issues. Wait a minute. So Kamala Harris is going to be the arbiter of who is a good gun owner. She's going to create a list of people that she now deems capable of taking firearms away from. You know, again, like the pandemic, you violate the mandate and now she is able to come into your home and take firearms, which she has done in the past and therefore would probably do again. Especially when she has already told us she is more than happy and more than interested in creating uh, action without Congress circumventing our government and the rule of law. We're talking about strip stripping away freedoms. So we know that looking at Kamala Harris in 2023, if we are correct, and Joe Biden is removed for the 25th Amendment because of mental deficiency, then we will see in January 
Kamala Harris sitting in the Oval Office, counting down 100 days until a time that she can put you on a list and take away your property, and because of that, also take away your children. And by the way, if you doubt that red flag laws would allow the government to take away your children, which they are doing right now in 18 states and have been doing since 1999, just look up the red flag laws and you will see we are correct. We've spoken to elected officials. We've spoken to a dozen different attorneys. We've spent over 18 months researching, actually at this point, three years researching red flag laws. It is a fact. It is true. So we know that Kamala Harris is flawed at the very least, in her economic policy and is looking to put forward ideas that are bankrupting the United States, increasing inflation and damaging small business. We know that Kamala Harris has indicated she is more than willing to break the Constitution, to usurp the power of Congress and to pass laws that will damage American citizens' rights to self-defense, to the Second Amendment and to their freedoms and families. What about Kamala Harris and immigration, the, the southern border, looking at domestic policies? Well, we can remember that Kamala Harris, as we saw reported, uh, and this is by the AP News, back in March, March 24th of 2021, Kamala Harris was picked by Joe Biden to be in charge of the southern border, as we heard in the conversation with Secretary Mayorkas and Senator Josh Hawley. And as Secretary Mayorkas correctly stated, she was put in charge of the southern border, of dealing with immigration at its root, which is something that really shouldn't take that long. Most Americans are very aware of why illegal immigrants are coming into our nation. In fact, most people in the world are aware of why. Because the United States has more freedom than anywhere else in the world. Just ask the former leadership of Hong Kong, who are now disappeared because of China. Ask the people of Taiwan. Ask the uh, Afghan refugees that came to the United States. Ask the people of Haiti, 17,000 that felt it was better to live under a bridge in the United States, in Del Rio, Texas, than it was to live anywhere else in the world. Living under a bridge in America is better than living in Brazil or in Haiti or anywhere else in the world. Yes, we know what the root cause of people coming to America is. And we know they're doing it right now because the Biden administration has opened the door. They have opened the floodgates at the southern border and allowed them to come in just like 12,000 of the 17,000 Haitians that were living under a bridge and are now dispersed throughout the United States. Harris and quoting the AP News, Harris is tasked with overseeing diplomatic efforts to deal with issues spurring migration in the northern triangle countries of El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, as well as pressing them to strengthen enforcement in their own borders, administration officials had stated. Well, that's interesting because we know that since March, actually since the Biden administration first came in, but since March, over 1 million illegal aliens have entered the United States to date. We know this for a fact from speaking with Secretary Mayorkas yesterday on the Senate floor. We know that over 125,000, let me say this again, because Secretary Mayorkas admitted this and spoke about this on the floor of the Senate Yesterday, November 16th, children have suffered from the child abuse that is being sent a thousand mile treks with sex slavers and drug cartels to die in the deserts and rivers connecting along that trip to come into the United States. And we found 125,000 of them amongst the countless numbers that have tried to make this trip. So that would be considered a failure. 
And Kamala Harris isn't done because she wouldn't even, after being put in place in March, in June, Kamala Harris was telling us she didn't need to see the southern border. She didn't actually need to go where the source of the problem was for the United States, our southern border. She didn't need to see the tens of thousands of children that were held at the southern border. She didn't need to see the illegal immigrants that were crumbing across the border with COVID and were being released into the United States. This is Axios News that is talking about this, that she was put in charge of solving the migrant issue and that she had not gone to the border, that Republicans have repeatedly criticized Harris for not visiting the border and, accord, uh, and accusing her of ignoring the crisis. And she did, we must say, she did eventually get to the border. Kamala Harris finally made it to the Mexican border, the U.S.-Mexican southern border, and that wasn't until June 25th. And the only reason why she went is because President Trump was going to the border. And she had to beat him to the punch because it was about the political image. She needed a photo op before President Trump got to the southern border. So she went down to the border. And that was the only time that she's been to the border. And Joe Biden has never been to the border. So we can establish that Kamala Harris is more than happy to take charge of critical issues for the United States only when it serves the ability to benefit her politically, to give her a photo op, and to give a boost in their polls and ratings. She didn't care. She spent months not caring, not being at the border, looking at the issue, at the issues there, trying to evaluate how bad the problem was and how to solve it. In fact, as we heard, and we can tell, how bad did it get? Because remember, when Secretary Mayorkas said, when he was asked by Representative Josh, uh, excuse me, Senator Josh Howley, and was asked, well, has she been at meetings with you? Has she been involved with policy with you? The answer to that is, no, she has not. According to the Daily Mail, and um, this is on October 8th of 2021, border czar, Kamala Harris, which is incorrect, but yet the person in charge of ending the migrant crisis at our southern border, she skipped crisis meetings with Mexican president so that she could visit a daycare in New Jersey. Does that sound like someone who's being responsible and on top of the job? Even the international press, this is the United Kingdom, recognizes the magnitude of this error. And Secretary Mayorkas was very clear. He couldn't mention, when was it? When was the last time she had been there? Several weeks. She's been in touch with him a handful of times. She's not involved in any policy that's affecting our southern border. What is she actually doing? It's a very strong question. A question that no one seems to have an answer for. But when we do see Kamala Harris doing something, she's embarrassing the United States. That's the one thing we do know that she's done. She's embarrassed the United States on an international level. And domestically, she has been ineffective at everything she's tried to do. And this is why her approval rating is at 28%. It is a historic low for any modern president, according to Yahoo News. This is on November 8th. This is even lower than when she was being compared to Dan Quayle in August. Historically low. Because she hasn't done anything. And every American is aware of it. It's the same reason why she was at 5% before she had a moment of sunshine of national attention and immediately went back to 5% when she dropped out of the race because Democrats did not like her. They did not respect her. They did not think she was qualified for the job and neither does the American public. 
And according to CNN, again, left-leaning news, the answer from Kamala Harris on why this is such a problem, why she's been ineffective, is racism. That's her answer. She's upset with the Biden administration. She is feuding with her, with the very same person who she pledged allegiance to to take the position of vice president. And she's currently fighting with the Biden administration because they have no confidence in her to give her any position because she has not achieved any of the goals that they have put in front of her. When they set, asked her to be in charge of immigration, we now have 61-year high immigration, illegal immigration. When they sent her to South Korea, she embarrassed the United States. When they sent her to Virginia, well, their Democratic candidate, Terry McAuliffe, lost. She's been ineffective every single place she's gone. And the American people have seen it and they are aware of it. What happens when Kamala Harris gets the opportunity to be in charge of the Oval Office in January of 2023? Will that benefit the American people? Will that help America economically? Will that help America in maintaining its freedoms? Will that help America with the national security issue at our southern border? Will it help Americans get jobs? What benefit comes to America from a Kamala Harris in the Oval Office? How is it any different than what Democrats thought in 2019 when they rejected her? That's our prediction. That America, as bad as things have been under the last 10 months of a Joe Biden in charge in the Oval Office, as bad as the economy is, as bad as immigration has become, as bad as our international uh, relations with France and England, and even with our enemies in Iran, North Korea, and especially China, as bad as this has been, Kamala Harris promises us that it will get worse. And that doesn't matter who wins the midterm elections. When the 25th Amendment is used to remove Joe Biden, which you are absolutely sure of, as his mental stability falters day by day, this is what we have to look forward to. Perhaps you think we've missed some information, that Kamala Harris has done something that has been beneficial to the United States. We look forward to hearing what that might be. Perhaps you think she is an effective leader, and we look forward to seeing what evidence you can provide of her doing so. Instead, we ask you to leave your comments and tell us what you think. And we hope that every Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, you will join us for our live stream to share your thoughts, not only about this, but any issue that is affecting America both today and in the future, and affecting the rest of the world as a consequence. We hope to see you, and we look forward to that time, and until then, we want you to be well.